Okay. Um, hello, everyone. So today we will talk about uh, turning Chromebooks into regular laptops. Uh, we'll go into a sort of detail of um, what uh, does it take to actually make them run Linux, because Chrome OS is in Linux, as you will see in a bit. So you know, let's start. So what we, who we are, uh, I'm a systems engineer by day, hacker by night, you know the story. Um, we, I contribute to AppStream Kernel, Fedora Project, PostMarket OS, and so on, so on. Um, I'm also one of three admins in the OR community, um, and I have a pile of ha hacked Chromebooks, as you, know, you may know. So I'm Domi. I have toyed with core boot and hardware hacking ever since ThinkPad X230 was still actually a reasonable laptop to own. Uh, I have been nerd sniped by Ellie into Chromebook hacking, so that's why I'm here. And you may know me from doing absolutely cursed stuff with Bash. Uh, search for this after the presentation, not right now. <laughs> okay. So what are those Chrome devices? It's not just Chromebooks. There are also um, like uh, Chrome bases and um, Chrome boxes. So those are um, devices manufactured by manufacturers like HP, Asus, Lenovo, according to Google specifications. Like, um, for instance, uh, they need to use specific amplifiers, embedded controllers, and uh, the firmware stack has to be open source and is actively maintained by Google. Um, so we have quite a variety of hardware. Like you can get one for like 30 to 50 euros on the cheapest uh, side. Those usually are made for students, and they're very durable and last like 12 hours on battery. So they're great. Then you have like middle range uh, like Pentiums, i3s with uh, varying uh, storage, and then you have uh, high end like Ryzen, NVMe. AMOLED screen, 16 by 10, so this is um, like a high-end stuff. Um, because Chrome OS uh, isn't really um, a thing that people want to use, um, they are considered e-waste, which is kind of sad because the hardware is actually very good, and you can find them very, very cheap on second-hand markets. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, the German Electric devices can be found for like 50 euros, and Tiger Lake, or which is what I have here, or Ryzen can be found for like 250 euros, which is you know a very great, very good deal. Search for uh, clear clearance sales because sometimes you can get them for literally nothing. Like they are really cheap, and like schools uh, get rid of them constantly because they get abused by students to students to hell and back. So yes, they are really easy to get hold of. Yes, in fact, this one has broken screen. I got it for 20 euros on the re in the recycling center. So, uh, and they have great debugging tools, um, and we'll talk about it in a bit. And pretty much most of the firmware stack is open. So, what's Chrome OS? Uh, it's basically kind of like Android. It uses uh, Linux kernel, but um, you know, of course, Google has their own patches. Uh, some of them are upstream. Some of them are not. Uh, and some people, or a lot of people, believe that it is based on Gen 2, but it's actually not Gen 2. Uh, it does use a portage as a build system, but uh, you know it's 64 bit and unless you have like an ARM device with under four gigs of RAM, then you have 32 bit user space. Uh, it uses AppStart as an Indie system, which was known in like Red Hat and Linux 6. Uh, use SL Linux and um, user space fully custom. For instance, you have uh, Linux containers uh, called Crostini. Uh, that's how you can get like Debian running on it. Um, ArcVM, which you can makes you poss it possible to run Android applications. Chrome OS audio server and a uh, replacement for uh, post audio or pipewire. And then BioD as a fingerprint user space fingerprint driver because fprint isn't really cutting it for those kind of devices. What's important to remember is that Crostini, like the Linux containers, uh, <coughs> like it is basically LXC with extra steps, but it has quite a lot of overhead, uh, not only because, well, Chrome OS is still running in the background, so it takes like a gig of RAM at least, but also because uh, it has a lot of indirections uh, between the hardware, so you can basically forget about running any highly performant applications on that. Uh, also, it's uh, non-trivial to actually make uh, like X server applications run on that. So like it's a whole bag of worms. 
it works. Some people have used it and loved it, but like we are not about that, just so you know. So, what is Corbett? Uh, it's an open source implementation. Uh, it's kind of similar to U-Boot, which is mostly used on ARM, and EDK2, which you can find on like, ARM servers and some development boards. Uh, UFI basic, EDK2 basically provides like um, UFI runtime services. Um, so core boot, as you, you probably know, and I thought, yeah. Mm. yeah. And uh, yeah, so uh, you can, f uh, you pro some of you probably know Core Boot from like a lot of old ThinkPads. Uh, that's how it got popular. And there's also like LibreBoot, which is the blobless implementation. And uh, well, those devices always had the problem of being like 10 fucking generations behind. <laughs> so they weren't really useful for uh, any real work unless you are a diehard. And uh, what changes here is that we actually can get uh, Core Boot on devices that are recent. Yes, in fact, it took us like a week to get Ryzen 7000 working, so, yeah. you know. Um, so, uh, no, they ship with Core Boot by default. Of course, uh, implementation isn't really compatible with upstream Linux kernel out of the box, but, um, you know, they mostly upstream their code, and we can use that to write patches for it. So, you know, what's, what's the point of our project? Like, if it's use core boot, then just use core boot, right? Well, kind of, because um, not all patches are upstreamed and there are differences in XPI tables and so on. So, Google uses DevCharge as a payload, which uh, requires a Chrome OS kernel partition scheme. Like, uh, you need to have three copies of the specific kernel partition. Um, I believe also rootfs, and also uh, you know because of the other three slots, uh, you, when they apply the upgrades, they can if uh, let's say an upgrade fails, they can roll it back. The problem is that it's not at all compatible with like anything that you'd ex expect. So this is not useful to us at all, and. Uh, we have some tools made by the community to actually work with DevCharge, but uh, again, this is not the direction that we want to go in. Um, DevCharge tools <coughs> was actually made by Alper Nebiasek, which is um, who's a um, Debian contributor. Mm -hmm. It's a great tool that basically wrote without any documentation. Uh, he basically looks at an ELF header to find out if the uh, architecture is x86 or ARM, but uh, you know it's still an abstraction layer. And because we have non-compliant XPI, that results in like broken USB, audio input devices, special touch screens, and uh, sleep. So you know we need to fix that in a firmware because um, otherwise um, it doesn't work. Uh, mainline kernel isn't well tested, like um, Google upstream stress tabs, but we don't think they're really um, testing it. Uh, we find a lot of regressions like all the time, and it's basically like con constant mouse and cut, cut mouse thing. Yeah, the important thing to remember here is that uh, Google upstreams the code and like just publishes it only because they are obligated to. And like uh, upstreaming uh, code isn't that much work when you actually do have it already and you don't want to be a GPL vi violator looking at some Chinese SOC vendors. Uh, but uh, yeah, they are not doing their best. They are not putting enough time to actually make this work. Uh, so we are the people that are doing those things. Yes. So Google actually does offer alternative payloads. Like you can, um, Diffrash has a memory allocation that can jump to, um, you might know CBIOS from old ThinkPads, EDK2 or U-Boot. But still, that, that still doesn't fix like XPI tables, so power sequencing, doesn't have NVRAM support. So basically, when you reboot, all the variables uh, are being lost. So yeah, so this is basically a cheap way to, uh, well, get core boot, get, get core booted, little mal. <laughs> uh, well, it is not useful for us just because we cannot fix bugs in it. Like, we could, but we, it involves us upstreaming into Google, and this is kind of missing the point. So, uh, yeah. yeah, we decided to do it ourselves. And what is the importance of open firmware? Like, we have uh, already touched uh, upon it a bit, but to reiterate, because this is really important to remember. Uh, 
if your device doesn't have a working firmware, and this is not only about Chromebooks, this is about your laptop that you may have right now. If something is broken, you can either rely on your manufacturer to actually fix it, maybe sometime, uh, or, or do nothing. There is there's, there's nothing else you can do. You can port core boot, but this will take like weeks. Meanwhile, and here, you can just fix it. You can just compile the code and it f fix your issues. And magically, you have a laptop that's no longer a paperweight. And it's actually important to notice because on most uh, laptops, you cannot just port core boot because of Intel boot guard, which uh, basically prevents you from running manu um, code that has been um, signed with manufacturer's keys. Uh, well, in this case, we don't have um, boot guard, so you know, we don't have that problem. So furthermore, uh, firmware updates have a lag uh, because the manufacturer of your device that uh, requires the firmware, so for example, the CPU, imagine the microcode. Uh, imagine uh, there's a patch in the microcode. It needs to go through, go through the pipeline of vendor, so your motherboard vendor, to you, and you need to flash it. Meanwhile, if you do it yourself, then you can just build your own BIOS image and flash it yourself. and possibly get the mitigation in hours instead of days or weeks sometimes. Yes. In fact, uh, we're not even vulnerable to logo fail because we're up to date with EDK2 and that kind of stuff. Yeah, logo fail was the uh, thing that you may, uh, some of you might have heard in the past months. Uh, basically an exploit in uh, the logo parsing routines, the, the boot logo parsing routines. And well, we never were vulnerable to it uh, because we had uh, EDK2 that was recent enough not to be. Yes. So we can uh, run edge cases, like we have people doing all sorts of wacky modifications to those devices. And because uh, the co um, code is open source, uh, even if, for instance, on uh, Alder Lake you want to replace EMC module with uh, NVMe, you can do that with, uh, if you patch Corbut. And, um, for instance, uh, so it doesn't work on stock firmware, but it works if you patch it. And when you flash or build, then you can just swap NVMe and it works. Um, so yeah. There's so many other reasons, like just think about it. We literally have people that started with hacking uh, Chromebooks and ended up in like with real jobs as firmware uh, developers, so that's really cool. Yeah, for instance, Mr. Chromebox, Mr. Yes, Matt Devier. precisely. Um, the cool part about Chromebooks is that the embedded controller is actually open. Like, this is something that may um, make your eyes open wide because historically the FSF was really just like fine with uh, the state of ThinkPad co uh, embedded controllers being closed. They're just like, eh, we can't do anything about it. Let's just may may maybe someday. So, yeah, th th here it's just open. Why the air quotes though? <laughs> well, basically, Google has pulled at Google again, so uh, they publish code, but uh, they do the least amount of work to actually make it usable for us. So we need a uh, uh, CH root to uh, like a specific uh, board for of Chrome OS so, uh, to actually build uh, a specific uh, cr uh, cross uh, it's a, uh, firmware. So this is a pain, but well, technically you can hack on it and. We will uh, probably work on making this situation better in the future. So look forward to that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, especially because they switched to Zephyr OS on in recent machines. Yeah, that's uh, also important. Uh, also because there's the, the uh, cross etsy isn't used only in Chromebooks. It's also used in some uh, framework laptops. So yeah, there, the, this, there is a whole ecosystem. And hopefully, this is going to expand even further. Um, so yeah, about our project, uh, the Krultrabook project, <laughs> go ahead. So basically we fix Google stuff. That's all yeah, whether they like it or not. <laughs> so we basically patch ACPI tables, or in case of uh, ARM, we recently started working on ARM devices. We patch uh, device trees and you know, mm, kernel modules. Uh, you know, there we have like platform specific code like uh, PWM backlight, GCSS controller, uh, Intel MOXES, like uh, power sequencing for touchscreen and other SQLC devices, because uh, you no know, touchscreen will not work on stock firmware. 
Well, the situation is actually getting better as Google is pulling our patches from upstream, but you know, it takes time. Mm, and then a lot of debugging like EDK2, which we're using to provide UEFI runtime services for these machines. And uh, we had a secure boot and PXE in release 4.20. And uh, you know, then debugging like NVMe, USB enumeration, EMSC, um, you know, and uh, there's also GOP, which initializes the display and provides users with uh, frame buffer, basically. And a lot, lot of uh, debugging and bug fixing. Like this is platform specific. Every different laptop has different quirks, <laughs> and there's nothing you can do to fix them globally because hardware is different. Hardware is a real world. Yes. Um, what do we do in the Linux kernel? Uh, this is like, a, we are repeating ourselves a bit with the, the core boot stuff because, well, we need support on both sides to make this correct. So, uh, ACPI tables once again. Uh, yes. We, uh, well, do the same dance with actually testing uh, the code that we're running because we have a community that relies on it. Uh, and we daily drive those machines anyway. Yes. So. Like, this laptop is literally a Chromebook. This laptop, which you might mistake for a thing, but it's also a Chromebook. And then, you know, a lot of uh, specific uh, vendors like uh, Intel Power Management Mox introduced in Tiger Lake and Alder Lake machines uh, gave us a lot of headaches. And um, even though we're, the workaround was simple, it took us a while to fix it because, you know, we all have four lives. Um, then you have uh, a specific uh, hooks for Chrome OS embedded controller, like uh, I squared C tunnels for the sensors for the lead and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and then audio because all post uh, 2016 machines had broken audio for years, and you know. Um, so, right? Yeah, audio is like a whole other bag of worms. Uh, you basically have hardware that is bespoke, and no Intel HD for you over here. We have codecs uh, and DSP chips. So it is uh, really uh, different uh, compared to what you might expect in a PC platform. Uh, nowadays we have like good kernel support, mainly because we have worked on it for so long that we actually like fixed a lot of those uh, issues. Uh, we're working with upstream distros to include uh, the kernel modules that are, are actually in Linux already, just including those in the standard kernel builds. And we've had great success so far, except for Canonical. Fuck Canonical. Uh, <laughs> then we have uh, devices using DSP. Uh, those are like post Skylake machines for. Um, for Intel, and on Ryzen 7000 and Steam Deck OLED, AMD started using some open firmware as well. Uh, so we also wrote our own use case manager configuration files because they're not one-to-one -one compatible. We have to actually rewrite them based on Chrome OS, and that's how we get uh, also to work and also Pipewire. Also, CM is basically the thing that tells uh, the kernel about the topology of your sound card, so where the mixers are, uh, what the pipelines look like, inputs, outputs, and like all of this. So this is required to get audio to work. Yes. And then uh, we have uh, Audio Voice Speech, which is a new kernel module introduced by Cesare Rojewski and um, Paul. Pierre Louis Bozart. Oh, no. So Google implemented uh, those limits in user space because they have full control over uh, what they ship on those machines. Like every board has their own builds, uh, but we don't control user space nearly as much, and we want to be distro agnostic. We don't want to people to rely on like one distribution. Like there used to be um, Gallium OS, which has died like three years ago and contributors had disappeared and there's no deprecation notice. So, you know, we are trying to upstream this stuff as much as possible. Uh, of course, this is still is not finished, we're working on it, and that's why on some devices we don't enable speakers yet. So, and if you think that we're accelerating, you know, that's uh, what happens if you try to actually run those machines without any limits. This is a Chromebook called Snappy, HP Chromebook, whatever. Um, and um, you can notice in the background that Maxim 98357A amplifier is getting hot. Over here. 
Yes. And the uh, left speaker actually got damaged. It got to 70 degrees, and the voice call had melted. So we really do not recommend running without any limits. Uh, it's worth noting that this is a time lapse from like two minutes, but uh, the heat up like literally takes only a few seconds, so it doesn't take much to damage your speakers permanently. Yes, because I increased the volume in also in incrementals because I didn't want to mm -hmm. lower them up outright. So. So uh, it's worth mentioning that like we have been praising the platform for being so open, so false, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's actually not all false. So like microcode is not false. I think that everyone has expected that, uh, and there is a whole bunch of stuff, uh, especially like the management engine and the AMD PSP, that is uh, not open at the, and it will probably never will be. Uh, but. Uh, there is some progress with uh, like upstreaming parts of it, uh, parts of the uh, firmware that's still blobs. Uh, Basic platform in code. Yeah. Uh, so this is a work in progress. Uh, hooray, AMD. Maybe uh, maybe we'll have like more open laptops. Uh, on ARM64, basically the same story. Like, uh, a we bit have better. A bit better. We have the drum training code, uh, power management, and a bunch of other things that are just bespoke and closed. Uh, actually, when you go to Qualcomm, it gets a bit worse, in my opinion, because you have the always on processor. This is just like the uh, Intel ME. Uh, Worth noting about Qualcomm, we don't have that many information about it because uh, those devices are expensive and, well, we pay with our own pockets for all of the development. So yeah. just, we haven't done much reversing on them yet, but this is a work in progress again. Yeah, for instance, in America, they cost like $150, uh, and here they cost like 600 euros or so. Yeah, and actually the same is true uh, in the other direction. Like you can get some devices in the US much cheaper than here. So just look around. Um, this is a fun slide. <laughs> uh, so many years ago, uh, there used to be those eBay sellers uh, proclaiming that, oh, we have made a privacy-aware laptop running LibreBoot and no blobs. It's so secure. So let's maybe compare those laptops to our offering. So of course we have open BIOS. Like this is a given. Uh, but on our end, we also has to have open embedded controller. That's kind of cool. Uh, unfortunately, on neither of those ends, we have uh, the Intel management engine slash AMD PSP actually open, like except the X60, but that's like old. It, it will be legal uh, to, to drink, like this is so, so old in a few years. So like, eh. And uh, we can't disable management engine on those platforms because uh, DSP firmware that is being loaded uh, onto a separate core that is uh, doing all the processing. Uh, has um, needs to be verified by management engine. So if the code, for instance, uh, needs to be signed with uh, Intel keys and we sign it with community keys, then it, the firmware will refuse to boot. And the same case is that if we disable a management engine, the handshake will fail and DSP will refuse to boot the firmware. So, you know. Yeah, next point. Uh it usually required special tools to flash, so like uh, an, either an external flasher or in some cases you could have gotten uh, around with uh, using like uh, exploits to flash core boot, but those, uh, like except for a few cases, those were really unreliable. Personally, I have bricked like four X60s using the exploits, so like I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but yeah, on our end, we just need a paper clip if you're like really unlucky and sometimes just a screwdriver. Driver. That's nothing. Um, is it available new? Well, Chromebooks, yes, think, but no. Unless you're willing to pay like really big margins, uh, is it reasonably fast? And like a lot of you will probably see this and think, oh gosh, we are overreacting. 2012 wasn't that long ago. Uh, and look, let me tell you, when I see prices of Chromebooks, Compared to their performance, and I compare to ThinkPads, there is no competition. Like seriously, the Chromebooks are Chromebooks are winning, uh, and yeah, the price. Like a ten-year-old device, surprisingly expensive. Uh, ThinkPads have this stigma around them, or maybe, maybe like just they, they are really expensive because they are popular, they are hackery, they are, they are cool, and 
well, we strive to make Chromebooks cool as well, so like maybe after this presentation, so you will get some hacker cred for using one, but like... <laughs> And yeah, long story short, you cannot ex escape blobs, so it's not libre. But uh, in practice, it's better than it was 10 years ago, and by a big margin, and we are heading towards like, making, making it even better. Uh, this is the practical part of the presentation. I'm hooked, I want a Chromebook, uh, how do I hack it? So, firstly, you need to pick up one device. We will have another section about precisely this in a second. Uh, and most of them can be had for really, really cheap. You should just look around. Uh, the easiest uh, way to do it is like x86 with, from Intel. Uh, great support, just nothing to be said. Uh, hard mode is AMD. We have some problems on some platforms, but like Ryzen is cool. Uh, and expert mode is ARM64. Basically, no support, but we're working on it. Ellie actually has like the only Chrome, um, ARM64 Chromebook in existence that's running Fedora. So like that's really cool. Uh, yeah, second step. Obtain or make a SUSE Q cable. Uh, this is not rec like this is recommended, but this is totally optional. You don't need this, but this gives you awesome uh, like tools to debug and uh, hack your Chromebook later. So, for example, you can uh, use this to unpick your Chrome, uh, Chromebook with Flash ROM just from another device, and it also exposes a bunch of UART ports. Uh, bonus, if you make a uh, CCQ cable yourself, you can debug some uh, phones with it, some like, Google uh, Pixels. Google Pixels with uh, Tensor chip. Mm. You just need to add TTL converter instead of plugging it into USB port. Yeah. Uh, third step, unlock write protect. And this really varies between devices. We have documentation, so like just figure it out what it is for your for yours Have it fun. is always possible and it is never problematic like on android phones where you need to unlock the bootloader and wait so you'll be fine and yeah flash and enjoy this is literally doable with no tools whatsoever you just need to unlock developer mode on chrome or use a physical cable and you're golden and yeah cool devices because we've talked uh, a lot of a lot about meta, but not about the devices. So there is this uh, framework, framework Chromebook. It really has no point being a Chromebook be besides, I don't know. Uh, it has Thunderbolt 4. This is really cool. It has a really nice screen. It's actually quite fast. And yeah, on the picture here, you can see uh, Coolstar running uh, like uh, Cyberpunk 2077 on the Chromebook with an GPU. So this is insane. This is something that's not possible on the original firmware, let, let me tell you. She also installed like 64 gigs of RAM in it. <laughs> so. Yeah, it has socketable RAM. This is really cool for like a laptop that's produced nowadays. Then there is the, our personal favorite, the Crane, Lenovo Duet. And uh, it's an ARM Chromebook. Uh, unfortunately, it only has four gigs of RAM, but it has great modding potential. So it has a detachable keyboard and it has Pogo pins. We have actually reverse engineered what they do. So this is like three volts, then USB pins, then uh, ground and one GPIO pin to measure like a resistor to check what's connected. Uh, we're not finished with anything with doing anything with it, but like we're planning to release uh, like models for making a mechanical keyboard for it. That would be really cool. Like mechanical keyboard and like expansion ports, basically. And yeah, it's just a really cool device. It's really lightweight. It's like 10 inches, and I would recommend it. And yeah, my personal fa personal favorite because I'm a ThinkPad diehard. Uh, we have a device that has a track point. And uh, it has a Ryzen CPU, 16 gigs of RAM in the top configuration, uh, an M2 slot inside, actually. And yeah, the outside I.O. is quite good as well. And as a bonus, it's a tablet. So uh, it has an integrated stylus that's uh, USI compatible. And you can just draw in. That's really cool. And uh, some of you might have heard of this one from like a video that was published by last uh, last week by Bringo Studios. Uh, this is basically a conferencing uh, room device, 
But if you open it, you find some really interesting things. Like, you have socketed RAM, an M2 slot. Uh, the best party trick of them all is the HDMI in. Like, I love that. And just think about what you can do with this. It also comes with Google Coral AI module installed. Yeah, so you can do fun stuff, presumably. <laughs> Assistant, yeah. yeah, so we'd like to thank all of those people, especially uh, people at Feral Labs, uh, Collabora, people at Chromium, Linaro, and U-Boot. Uh, our community as well, because it wouldn't be possible without them. And, well, everyone that has helped with it, us with the presentation. So, yeah, many thanks. Great. And, yeah, contributions welcome. This is basically everything. If, I have, if you have any questions, then feel free to ask them. Wow, cool. Thanks a lot for this presentation. Uh, so we have uh, about eight minutes for Q&A. So please line up to the microphones. I think we start with microphone number whatever. Number two. Hello. So thanks for the talk. Uh, I have two questions. One is a simple one. So have you ever seen the Chromebook without a pouch battery? Something more kind of without. 18650. Define pouch battery. Uh, the the, the oh, light. okay, I get it. Yeah. Um, there are some really old Chromebooks with 18650s. Uh, I'm thinking ThinkPad X131E, right. uh, but I wouldn't recommend getting them because they suck royally in terms of per performance. So, yes, but actually no. Okay, and the second question is like how modifiable, so you mentioned the EC firmware is uh, mm -hmm. open source, but how modifiable it is? How is it feasible to change like a charging behavior or something like that? Uh, um, yes, you can change uh, basically whatever you want. You can make it so it wouldn't wake up if you open the lid. You can uh, change like uh, charging constraints. We actually have a user space tool version by our community that can limit uh, charge like let's say 85%. And you can also control the fan and also like PWM backlight and all sorts of stuff, so, you know. And most of those features are actually in stock, so if you launch EC tool, and that's an open source tool by Google, uh, then you can just send comments to, to the EC to like either engage the fans or uh, disable them or like just f do stuff, that's really cool. Um, wow, we're, going, we're, going, we're getting a demo. Yes. So I think, that was a nice uh, as, as long as you prepare a demo, I will just announce that we're probably running out of time for all the questions. So uh, maybe, we can, no maybe we can have one Thank from you. the internet in between. Is that possible? Uh, yes, it is. Um, the question is on modern Chromebooks, where uh, are undoc uh, undocumented jumpers, uh, how you can find them to unlock the uh, flash? Uh, well, uh, for most of them, we have documentation on our wiki. For the ones that we don't, uh, there isn't going to be that many of those jumpers on the mother more. So you are probably going to find the spot that looks like you should bridge it. And if it looks like it should, uh, if it looks like a duck, it's probably a duck, you know? Uh, worst case, you can also just short the pin 3 and 8, which is uh, pulling uh, bright protect pin high to VCC rail, and that way you can also bypass hardware by product. It's documented in SPI doc documentation, so. Interesting. Microphone number one, please, now. Uh, so, uh, are you aware of the speaker safety demon that's uh, developed as a part of the Asahi project? Uh, because, well, that's kind of similar to what you're trying to achieve with the audio limiting things. Great question. Uh, we actually don't have smart amplifiers. The problem with that uh, is that sound open firmware introduces uh, limits in uh, firmware. And uh, from user space, you don't know that the limit is even there. Uh, but uh, those amplifiers are like a dump amplifiers. So the only control you have over it is setting GPU open low and high. Then in the driver, if there is nothing playing for 15 seconds, it sets uh, GPI open low but uh, we don't have any control like for temperature monitoring or anything like that. So it has to be done either in the firmware or we have to do like explicit curve how to limit the power that the uh, amplifier is outputting. Uh, we're working, working with guys from Intel on it, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a work in progress. Good, let's take microphone one again. 
Hi, great talk. Um, I just saw the Bringer Studio video recently. I guess you are the people that helped them getting yep. this ab abomination to work. Um, so I have a question about this. Uh, in the video you can see that the performance of his device is not that great. Is this in some way firmware related or is this just misconfigured? No, it's because it's a Cable Lake mobile platform. It's like I think Core i5 1850U which is really not very, well, you, he made a video about gaming, which is not for gaming. <laughs> but uh, for us hackers, it would be a great potential for running like um, OpenWRT on it or PFSense. So, you know. It could also be a great streaming PC because it has like hardware encoding, so you can possibly capture the HDMI, probably mix in a camera and upload that to Twitch or YouTube. Like, that would be cool. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Could we have another question from the internet, please? Yes, this is a more general question. Um, are there many Chromebooks with easily upgradable RAM? Um, unfortunately, the only one we know about is a um, very old one, I think, Parrot, which is Haswell, and the uh, framework Chromebook that we have, have talked about. So, unfortunately, most of the RAM is soldered, and you have like SPD profiles in Core Boot. So, uh, you probably could upgrade it if you have a hot air, but you know, then if you have a hot air, then you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so, it's important to remember that Chromebooks are like 10 years old, and some of the old old devices did have socketed RAM, but you shouldn't really get anything older than 2018. Uh, though the Chromeboxes do actually have upgradable RAM. Yep. Okay, microphone number two now, please. Uh, yes, I have a question on the AVS. Uh, and uh, have you verified if there's any DC current through a differential driver of that speaker causing the heat up instead of the audio content and equalization of it? Yes, we poked it with the uh, oscilloscope and we found that basically, uh, mm, how does it work? Is that uh, so, uh, in some of the open firmware, they've put like um, a limit. Um, we're not exactly sure how that works because then again, uh, even though it's open source, we have a lot of things to do. Uh, we know that with open so open so uh, with soft, uh, you can uh, run it on some machines, um, but you won't get like headphone jack working. But then on AVS, you can uh, get it working with just a headphone jack for now. Um, and we know that with AVS firmware does have it implemented. Uh, from what we've heard from Cesare, but uh, we don't have topology for this yet. So, you know, and apparently that's a problem with some kind of vendor and, you know, sorry. Okay, so we take one more question from the internet and all the other questions, I think we don't have time for them, but you can come to the stage later on and talk to the speakers and uh, probably ask your questions um, yourself. Yeah, okay. Um, one question was, uh, at the beginning of the talk, you talked about the AMD Ryzen CPUs running within a week. Uh, how did you get the AGE-SA updates, though? Right, so AMD uh, CPUs are right, right now are a terrible hack. We hacked a verified boot to load burst stage, uh, design burst stage on ARM core from stock firmware. And we basically hacked the VBoot API to boot uh, up to date uh, core boot builds. It is a terrible hack, and we're hoping to get updated builds soon. But for now, um, you know, it's a, it's a hack, and uh, it, it can be a bit unstable. So we're really careful with the uh, builds we're publishing. Okay, Ellie and Domi, thank you again for this nice thank talk. You.